So we pour out our praise, pour out our 
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and the shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcomed come fly this place and fill the
guys. Good evening. I uh, just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for everyone who's been tuning in live to the various studies here on our Somebody Loves You Worldwide YouTube and also on the various other platform, platforms, whether it's on uh, calvarygs.org or the Somebody Loves You Church app. Uh, we're just so thankful for the opportunity that we have to minister to all of you. And we pray that's what's taking place, that all of you are being ministered to during this kind of awkward time, uh, time of a little bit of unrest. We pray that you're being encouraged through the word that is coming forth from all of our platforms. And we pray that you, you are encouraged. So as always, we want to encourage you guys to go back to Calvary Chapel Golden Springs Instagram page for all of the uh, scheduling um, of the teachings that are going to be taking place weekly, um, and especially tuning in tomorrow night to Pastor Sean McKeon's study, W Live at 7.30. It's going to be a great uh, time in the Lord. But as I said, we are doing all that we can to minister to you, to encourage you during this time. So make sure that you do follow us. If you haven't followed Pastor All on Instagram, make sure that you do that. You'll be getting his, uh, his daily encouragements. Follow the church on Instagram at Calvary Chapel Golden Springs. Um, make sure that you subscribe to Somebody Loves You Worldwide's YouTube. Click the bell for all the notifications and uh, when studies will be dropping. But this evening, I'm definitely excited for this opportunity um, to teach you all here this evening. Those of you who um, maybe do not have the opportunity to normally attend here on a Thursday night, you, you have this opportunity, and I'm excited for that. I'm excited to be able to go through the Word of God. And one thing that I do ask, any of the, st the studies that you're listening to, uh, during this time, make sure that you are sharing these studies on your Facebook page or on different uh, social media platforms that you have. We want to do all that we can to not only get the Word of God out ourselves, but also to equip you uh, to get the Word out as well. So if you uh, tuned in last week to uh, the Pursuits Bible Study here on Somebody Loves You Worldwide, um, I mentioned that we are starting a new Bible study in the book of First Peter, the theme being faithful in affliction. Last week we covered the intro and the first five verses and we're going to plug through the rest of the chapter this evening but before we do so I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now and we're just going to ask the Lord to go before us uh, during this time. Father, we thank you so much for your love, your grace, your compassion, and your mercy, Lord. We ask that you would continually just go before us during this time, Lord. Prepare our hearts, Lord. Um, we do ask that you would anoint this time, Lord, that you prepare our hearts to receive your word. Lord, in the word that goes forth uh, this evening, I pray that it would be uh, multiplied, Lord, that you would take um, this study as you did the, the loaves and the fish, Lord, and multiply it, Father. Uh, encourage hearts. I pray that people will come to know you, that people will grow in the knowledge of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like I said, back in the book of First Peter, uh, going through this study titled Faithful in Affliction, if you were here last week, you had the opportunity to listen to the study. Uh, we covered the first five verses, and we saw um, everything that the Lord was speaking, uh, trying to minister to us about. Um, we looked at a little bit of who Peter was as an individual and how the Lord uh, ministered to him for three and a half years and how the Lord drastically changed his life through the power of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. But one thing we learned in the life of Peter that the Lord was faithful to him. The Lord was faithful to complete the work that he began in Peter. And now we see Peter roughly 62 to 64 years after uh, the death of Christ uh, fulfilling the call of God that the Lord promised he would. He's encouraging the sheep. He's tending the flock that the Lord told him to do. He's being faithful to this commandment to do everything that the Lord had entrusted to his care. He's tending the body of Christ, and he's writing to people who are suffering. He's writing to Christians who are suffering, and because of their suffering, for the gospel's sake, they've been scattered from their homes. They've been scattered from Jerusalem um, into different areas of the Gentile world, and he refers to them as pilgrims of the dispersion, literally strangers here on this earth. He's reminding them that during their suffering, um, to, have a whole, uh, to have a loose touch here on this earth. Uh, and suffering will do that. Suffering will remind us that this earth is not our home, that we were um, not created to dwell here 
permanently. But he quickly, in verse 2, reminds them of who they are in Christ, that they were elected according to the foreknowledge of God. So Peter, in his opening greeting, and in these first five verses, does something incredible here. He reminds them who they are in Christ, he reminds them that they have been, giving an, been given an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and it doesn't fade away. And because of this, uh, we have a living hope. And that during our trials, he's going to say in verse 5, that we are kept uh, by the power of God. So uh, let's begin our study this evening by looking at verse 6. He says, In this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What Peter is doing here in verses 6 through 9 is giving us this perspective of God's purposes in our trials. Look at verse 6 again. He says, in this you greatly rejoice. What are we greatly rejoicing in? He's bringing us back to these previous statements that he had made, that we are being kept by the power of God, that in the midst of our weakness and suffering and challenges and difficulties have a, of, of a, have a way of reminding us uh, who we are not, and forcing us to put our eyes back on the Lord, to, to remind us of our own weakness so that we can be forced to this place of dependency upon the power of God. And Peter reminds us that we are being kept up by the power of God, and it is in this that we can greatly rejoice. He goes on to say, Though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Let's take a moment to break down verse 6 a little bit. He says, though now, for a little while. This word or this phrase, for a little while, literally means for a short season. The perspective that Peter is seeking uh, to give to the church, to those suffering, scattered Christians, is that all of our suffering is temporary. It's but for a little season. That's one great temptation that the enemy loves to bring into our hearts and bring into our minds. This feeling that our suffering and our trials and our temptations are never going to end. And when we put our, our hearts and our minds in this place that our trials are never going to end, that it's going to last forever, our hearts begin to become despondent. We, we enter into this time of depression, of feeling that there is no way out of this. And it is in that time that we need to encourage ourselves in the Lord. As David would say, Why are you cast down on my soul? Hope thou in God. And that is what we are hoping, hoping in. The truth in verse 6, that all of our suffering is just for a little while. It's only for a season. And the Lord is doing a work in the midst of this season. He is faithfully plowing the ground of our hearts, especially during this season that we find ourselves in. We are investing in the root of our relationship with Jesus, probably now more than ever before. There's nothing else that we have an opportunity to trust in but Jesus during this time. And the Lord is, is doing a work in this season that is not going to last forever, but he wants it to yield eternal fruit. And I want to encourage you that in, in that in this evening, that we need to, to maximize the opportunity that lies before us in this season. An opportunity to wait upon the Lord. An opportunity to seek what he has for us. An opportunity to invest in our homes. An opportunity to invest in our marriages. An opportunity to invest in our children. To invest in the things that the Lord is setting before us day by day, because as Peter's reminding us, this is only going to be for a little while. In, grand, in, in light of the grand scheme of eternity, this challenge that we're going through is only for a season. And we need to take it that way, because if we don't, we're going to lose perspective. We're going to lose hope. 
we need to understand that the trials that we're going through today, it may, for you, maybe it is the trial of, of having to be quarantined, or maybe the quarantine is just a, another trial on top of other trials in your life. Know this, that it's only for a season, and we need to guard our hearts and guard our minds uh, with uh, this truth. He goes on to say, though now for a little while, if need be, so look, the, the Lord doesn't allow anything into our lives unless it is needed for the, the, the production of our spirituality. Um, the trial that we're going through as a nation, as challenging as it is, it's needed. It's producing godly sorrow that leads a man to repentance. The trials that we find ourselves in as we progress through a season of suffering, we will find that It was in fact needed and the Lord and in his wisdom has allowed these things in our life to strip away the areas of our life that are not pleasing to him, to add to the areas of our lives that are lacking. So what we'll be able to see as as Peter is saying, as he's seeking to give us his perspective in our suffering, is that though our trials are for a season, they are needed. They're needed to have this, this work in our life. That's why James would say in James chapter 1 to count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work in you that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In the trials in our life, look, all trials are rooted in a sense of loss. We are, in suffering, we experience the hurt, the pain, the discomfort of losing something that we once held dear in our life. But what James says in James chapter 1 is that in the midst of our loss, the Lord is in the business of adding and multiplying to our life. He is adding the things that are needed to us. And in his wisdom, he has sought fit to allow us to go through difficulties in our lives. He says, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. This word various literally means multicolored. Our trials come in many different forms, in many different, um, through many different uh, challenges in our life. And at times, our trials are various. The sufferings that we're going through today may not be the sufferings that we're going to go through a year or ten years from now. In different seasons of our life, suffering looks different. But the truth remains the same. Suffering is a, real, is a reality in the life of both believers and non-believers. But suffering is different for the believer. Suffering is promised in the Bible. The Bible says that all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That many are the afflictions of the righteous. The Bible tells us that we are going through to go through difficulties, but what we have in the midst of our difficulties, as various and multicolored as they are at times, is a promise that they are only for a season and that God is actively involved in the midst of them. We have the picture in Jeremiah 18 of of the potter and the clay. As the Lord tells Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house and look what he's doing on the will. We are the clay, he is the potter. We remain in the hands of the potter and he is molding us and he is shaping us into a vessel of honor, a vessel of glory so that we can then be filled up and poured out for his sake. He always, has, um, he, he always has the speed of the will in control. The Lord is in complete, complete control of our circumstances and he's seeking to fashion something that Peter is in fact going to tell us about here in verse 7. Look at verse 7 with me. He says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice what Peter's saying here right now. Your faith is the object of testing. The reality of what's taking place in our world right now is the coronavirus, the COVID-19 pandemic. But the issue that the Lord is concerned about is the issue of your faith as an individual. The genuineness of your faith. 
being much more precious than gold that perishes. Gold, as it is today, just like it was in ancient times, was a very precious commodity. And Peter is setting before us a word picture here. He's relating our faith to the preciousness of gold. When a goldsmith is, is preparing or, or getting ready to, to make the, the gold, he, he puts it in the fire. When gold goes into the fire, it doesn't look like much. But as he continues to heat up the furnace, all of the impurities are moved away. And then he scrapes those impurities off the surface of the liquid gold. And he keeps heating it higher and higher and higher until all the impurities in the gold are completely moved away until the goldsmith can see his reflection in that gold. And as soon as he can see his reflection, he knows that the fire can be turned down and the gold can be cooled and it can be hardened because it is pure and it is genuine. That's what the Lord does in the midst of the fires in our life. The Lord is in complete control of the temperature of the fire that we are in. But his eye is always on the faith of the believer. He says the genuineness of our faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is test by, tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory. Notice, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter goes on to give us the truth of what's really taking place in the midst of our suffering. The Lord is testing our faith. This time, any trial that we find ourselves in, it's always going to be an issue of our faith. So what do we need to do if that is true in the midst of of suffering? We need to feed our faith. How do we do that? The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to continually wash our minds with the truth of the word of God. We need to choose to set our mind on the truths of the word of God. We need to, as the Bible says, to pray without ceasing and to rejoice always. We need to be very diligent about walking in the spirit so that our faith can be built up. If our faith is God's greatest concern in the midst of our testing, our faith should be our greatest concern in the midst of our testing as well. It should be the object of our focus just as it is the object of God's focus. To be continually building ourselves up in the most holy faith, faith as the scripture would go on to say. Peter goes on in verse 8, he says, Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What Peter is continuing to do as we come to the end of this first point is Peter is seeking to give us the perspective of eternity. He wants us in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our difficulties, as he is writing to suffering Christians during this time, to have an eternal perspective in the midst of suffering. To understand that there will be a day when this earth fades away and we will be in the presence of the Lord and we will, see, we will hear from the words of our Savior, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Look what I have prepared for you. There are rewards waiting for the child of God who has faithfully endured the troubles of this life in eternity. The Lord wants us to have this mindset as we're going through difficulty, that our trials are only for a little while, that we need to understand that the Lord is doing a work in our lives and that our trials, in fact, are needed as various as they are at times. We need to focus on the reality that God's focus is our faith, that he is seeking to produce genuine faith in us, but we also need to have an eternal perspective. Uh, that there will be an end to our trials just as there will be an end to our time here on earth. That our salvation won't be complete until we are glorified in the presence of the Lord. But let's look back quickly at verse 8. He says, Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice 
with joy inexpressible, full of glory. Peter is hitting on the issue of their belief. Something that we need to continue uh, to do. As Jesus would say, don't, don't be unbelieving, but believing. Remember, the children of Israel, when they were wandering in the wilderness in their lives, the Bible says that they died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. We need to refuse to be unbelieving. We need to continue, as Peter says here in verse 8, to rejoice with joy inexpressible, thanking the Lord for all that he's done in our life, thanking the Lord for what he's doing in our life and in our nation, in the church presently. We need to fix our hearts upon him and be people of faith who see with the eyes of faith, who have a believing heart. So what Peter has done for us in verses 6 through 9 is he has laid out the purpose of our trials. The purpose of our trials is is ultimately to give us perspective that uh, we are to rely on the divine resources of God, that we are kept by his power, that though our trials are very real, they're only but for a season, that they're needed And that our faith is the object of God's focus in the midst of our sufferings. And in our sufferings, he is very involved in the midst of all of them. That's what Peter wants to do to to the suffering believers. He's encouraging them in the Lord that there is in fact a purpose in our trials. Peter is now going to move on to uh, reminding the believers who are suffering about God's plan for salvation. Look at verse 10 with me. He says, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories of that would follow. The believers who Peter is writing to were suffering because of their faith, because of the message that they proclaimed they were enduring persecution. And during this time, Peter's seeking to encourage them about the importance of God's plan for salvation. He is reminding them that they are in the middle of the work that God was seeking to accomplish in ages before they were even in, even in existence. We need to guard our minds with this truth. Um, when we suffer as believers, we need to remind ourselves that we are either suffering because of our disobedience or we are suffering because of our obedience. And the enemy is seeking to destroy our faith But the Lord is seeking to build our faith. And as we are suffering, we need to remind ourselves that those who went before us suffered for their belief. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. So Peter is seeking to remind the church in verses 10 and 11 about God's plan of salvation and to remind them and to give them the perspective that because of the message that they bear and the the trials that they are enduring, God's faithfulness will prevail, just as he was faithful to those prophets of old. Notice what he says again in verse 11. He says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. The Bible says this in in the book of Romans that If God did not spare his own son, how much more will he uh, freely give us all things? The Bible says also in the book of Romans that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glories that shall be revealed. In the Christian life, glory is on the other end of suffering. Just as it was true for Jesus, it is true for us. Notice verse 12, he says, To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you 
by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. He's reminding them that the Old Testament prophets prophesied of the coming Messiah, that salvation would come through his name, that salvation would be extended to the Gentiles, and that this is the great mystery. And he says at the end of verse 12, he says, things which angels desire to look into. If you have your Bibles in front of you, I would encourage you to circle this word desire. Because this word desire denotes a strong interest or craving and a continued um, internal yearning to comprehend the mystery of human salvation. The, in other words, the angels look down at God's involvement in our life and God's plan of salvation at work in our lives and they look at it with an earnest um, craving and a continued yearning to comprehend the love of God. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians the same truth, that the, the angels uh, look down upon us as children of God to learn about the love of God. They're, they're mind blown about this. And Peter is seeking to encourage the believers in this. Look, you are saved. You've been bought with the price. He, he tells them in verse two that they were elect according to the foreknowledge of of God. And he's reminding them that not only did the Old Testament prophets prophesy about the salvation that they are partaking of and suffering for, uh, but also the angels, these angelic be beings, have this earnest desire to look into the lives of the believers to learn about the mysteries of salvation. So, this chapter in chapter one, it's all about a perspective. Peter is seeking to lay out the believer's perspective in the midst of suffering. He talks about the purpose of suffering in verses 6 through 9. In verses 10 through 12, he talks about God's plan of salvation and how this should encourage the believers who are suffering uh, for the message of the gospel. But he's going to go into, from verses 13 to the end of the chapter, the Christian's pattern of living. He's going to tell us how we should then live in light of our present circumstances. And he addresses uh, something extremely important in the beginning of verse 13. He, he addresses the issue of the believer's mind. Look at what he says in verse 13. He says, Therefore, Gird up the loins of your mind. He says, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This word, gird up the loins of your mind, is a, is a word picture. In, in Old Testament times or in ancient times, um, in order to... Um, to be unimpeded in movement, men would, would uh, gird up their long garments and tie, tie them around their waist with a leather belt to be unhindered when they were getting ready to go to work or when they were getting ready to go uh, to war. They would gird up their loins when they were getting ready to do work. They, were getting, they would gird up their loins when they, were, when they were getting ready to go to war. And the same is true in our lives. We need to gird up the loins of our minds so that we may be unimpeded in our work for the Lord. So that we may be unimpeded in our warfare as believers. Uh, the Bible says... That as, as Peter is, is reminding us to gird up the loins of our mind, the Bible tells us if we commit our thoughts to the Lord, our works will be established. See, there is much said in the Bible about proper Christian thinking. And especially during times of suffering, we need to get rid of loose and sloppy thinking. We need to be begin to, to cultivate uh, a disciplined mind as believers. We need to develop a disciplined mind as believers. We need to, especially during this time, give heed to what we allow into our eyes right now, which will depict the condition of our minds. That we need to uh, 
protect our ears during this time, what we allow ourselves to listen to during this time so that we could protect the condition of our mind. We need to develop disciplined minds during times of warfare so that we could be ready and willing to work for the Lord. The Bible tells us that we should be diligent about controlling our thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5 says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. We need to be diligent about bringing our thoughts captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 3, in verses 1 and 2, Paul exhorts us to set our minds on things above, not on things on this earth, because you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In the book of Philippians in chapter 4 and verse 8, uh, Paul tells the church, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are of are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, notice what he says. He says, meditate upon these things. Joshua, just as he was getting ready to go fight these wars in the promised land, the Lord would tell him, if you will meditate on my word day and night, you will have good success. We need to allow the word of God to be the source of our meditation in times of difficulty. We need to choose to set our mind on the things that are true, the things that are noble, the things that are love-worthy, the things that are praiseworthy. We need to set our mind on these truths. We need to be diligent about developing a disciplined mind. We need to, as Peter says, gird up the loins of our mind and he says to be sober. This word to be sober literally means to be of a calm and collected spirit, to be free from every mental and spiritual loss of self-control. During this time, as believers, we should be the ones who are under control. We should be living sober lives. Our life should be full of the Spirit, full of the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. He says, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy, says the Lord. We should never allow our circumstances as believers to depict our conduct. We should be like Daniel. As Daniel found himself in Babylonian captivity, he would say in Daniel 1 verse 8 that he purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the portions of the king's delicacy. What Peter is telling us, during the the times of temptation, the, the flesh is going to experience weakness. And in its weakness, there's going to be a temptation to begin to conduct your lives as you used to. What Peter is saying, do not not be um, given into the temptation to go back to loose living, but allow your conduct to be holy because holiness is always the standard. The Bible says, for without holiness, no one will see the, see the Lord. We're to be holy in our lives. We are to be righteous people during this time. In my time of devotion, I'm going through the book of Genesis again. And in reading in Genesis chapter 6 through 9 in the life of Noah, It says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and that Noah was a righteous man. When everyone around him was wicked, the Lord delivered him because of the conduct of his life. He was a righteous man. And during this time, we need to be committed to living holy lives now more than ever before. We need to be committed to walking in the Spirit and putting away the works of the flesh so that we could experience the power of God, so that we could discern the voice of God. During this time, we need to ask ourselves, 
are we pleasing the Lord? And every challenge we find ourselves in, we need to calm our hearts, we need to calm our minds, and we need to say, Lord, is this pleasing you? My thought life, is my thought life pleasing you? The amount of time I'm spending in front of a screen, is that pleasing to you? The way I'm treating my spouse, is that pleasing to you? Lord, search my heart. I want to be righteous before you. I want my prayers to be heard. I want my prayers to be answered. I want to experience fellowship with you. Look at verse 7. He says, But if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, he says, Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. He's talking about a godly reverence. He just exhorted us to live holy lives. He says, and if you call on the Father who is holy, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that we should depart from evil and fear the Lord, have a, a, have a reverence for the power of God. Now more than ever before, if the world is not reverencing the Lord, we are in deeper trouble than, the, than we can perceive. If the church is not on their face before the Lord during this time in great reverence and fear of the Lord, we are in deeper trouble than we perceive. All we can control is our own walks with the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 25 and verse 14, verses 13 and 14, that the secrets of the Lord are with those who fear him. I want to know the heart of God during this time. I want to know what he has to say to me as a husband, what he has to say to me as a father, what he has to say to me as a leader. I want his direction during this time of my life. And he promises that if we call out to him, he will show us great and mighty things that we do not know. That if we have this reverential fear for him, the secrets of the Lord will be revealed to us. Peter goes on, uh, to talk about the Christian's pattern of living. He tells us we need to, to guard our minds during this time, that we need to have disciplined minds, that we need to live a, spirit a spirit-filled, spirit-led, self-controlled lives, that we need to live holy lives in the fear of the Lord. And this is the reason why in verse 18, he says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and your hope should be in God. What Peter lays before us that should really motivate our holy and righteous and disciplined conduct is the price that was paid for us as believers. That we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from our aimless conduct, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Our salvation cost the Son of God his, his suffer, cost the Son of God suffering. The, the Lord, who was before all things, emptied himself and took on the form of a man so he could suffer. For you, so he could suffer for me. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Apart from the blood of Jesus, we would not experience salvation. We would not have a living hope. We would not have our inheritance in heaven. We would not know that we are kept by the power of God. We would not know that our trials are only for a season and that they're for a purpose and that the Lord is perfecting our faith during this time. We would not have the ability to guard our minds and live self-controlled holy lives apart from the blood of the cross. Everything in our life brings us back to the reality and the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Apart from the cross, there is no hope in our lives. 
And Peter's reminding them, remember the price that Jesus paid for your salvation. Hebrews tells us this. He says, consider him who suffered unto bloodshed for us. We need to do that in the midst of our sufferings. We need to remember that Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. We need to remind ourselves that the Son of Man had nowhere uh, to lay his head. We need to spend time in Isaiah 53 reminding ourselves as, uh, of the, the prophecies of Christ and the sufferings that he endured so our salvation could be obtained. He was a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was the only perfect sacrifice and he was ordained before the foundations of the world peter goes on to say look in your bibles with me in verse 22 he says since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren love one another fervently with a pure heart peter tells us that we should guard our minds that we should live soberly. Peter tells us that we should conduct our lives um, in, in a holy manner, not given into the, the lusts of the flesh as we did before we knew the Lord. That we should remember that our salvation costs the blood of his son. But he tells us how we should conduct our lives towards others right now. The call of the Christian is to love. He says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, he says, in sincere love for the brethren, love one another fervently. Be diligent to show love to believers, to the world. That is the mark of a Christian. Loving one another, this word love here is the word agape. It's a selfless love. It's... it's, it's um, it's, it's the giving of oneself away for the betterment of another. And he says we're to do this fervently with a pure heart, with no motives in our hearts, simply because we love God and we love people. And loving people this way is only possible for those who have been born again. He says in verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides Forever. Peter is going to do something amazing at the end of this chapter. He's going to talk about the lasting and abiding value of God's word. And I find it interesting that he does this after he has said so much about suffering. After he has said so much about the trials that believers endure and the perspective that we should have here. He says again in verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower fades away, but the word of God, the word of the Lord endures forever he's quoting out of Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8 he says the grass withers it fades away man wither and they fade away in Psalm 103 it says the that man's life is like the flower of the field it springs up it vanishes away its place is remembered no more but the word of the Lord that is what endures forever that is what we need to put our minds on during the times of our difficulty understanding that God's word endures forever what's not endured forever is people's monetary success people's monetary security what has not endured forever is the health of our nation and our world. What has not endured forever is the confidence or the confidence that we have in our government and in, in, in our in, in leaders and officials during this time. We have no option but to trust in the word of the Lord during times of difficulty. And the best approach to difficulty is to fall back on what you do know in times when your your mind and your heart are full of a lot of things that you do not know know because God's word abides forever 
And he closes by saying this. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. He reminds them in the midst of their suffering of the enduring value and power of the word of God. That it abides forever. And it is this word that has saved your soul and that promises you the comfort of God and the power of God in the midst of your affliction. Those are the things that we need to be focused on in the midst of our trials. That we're being kept by the power of God. That our trials are not forever. That they are for a purpose. That the Lord is perfecting our faith. That we need to have an eternal perspective in the midst of our suffering. That we need to remember that the prophets of old prophesied about the message that we in fact are suffering for. That the angels of the Lord, that angelic beings, desire intensely to look into this mystery of salvation that is at work in our lives. And that we are to conduct our lives in a holy manner. We are to gird up the loins of our mind. We're to develop disciplined minds and self-controlled lives. And we're to remember the price that has been paid for our salvation. And we're to love one another fervently. And we are to keep our hearts and our lives, our minds abiding in the never-changing Word of God. Guys, I pray you've been encouraged this evening here through this study. I, I encourage you to stay tuned to everything that's taking place here on Somebody Loves You Worldwide. I encourage you to share this through uh, your social media platforms. Know that all of us here at Calvary Chapel Golden Springs are, are, are praying for you. We encourage you uh, to be faithful in your walk with the Lord and to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. We love you guys. We'll see you next Thursday here at The Pursuit on Somebody Loves You Worldwide.